Uh, so with Hashem's loving grace, we're continuing to learn the language of Amuna. Today's lesson is entitled Outstretched Arms. Now, for those who are new to the series or new to this particular lesson, I'm going to give a little introduction, and this will bring us back. Uh, we'll all be on the, on the same level with what we learned so far. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're not teaching uh, anything about religion. Uh, Amuna, this has got nothing to do with religion. We're talking about Amuna is not just faith. It's one's personal faith that brings a person to an intimate relationship with the Almighty. Okay, so one's personal relationship with the Almighty, that's your Muna, that's the most valuable asset a person has. There's nothing more valuable. And we'll explain why. Why? Because a Muna guarantees a meaningful life. It guarantees inner peace. I don't care what anyone says. There's no such thing as inner peace without a Muna. No one's got real inner peace. And therefore, Emuna is the key to emotional and spiritual health. And when a person is healthy emotionally and spiritually, that does wonders for the bodily health. Okay, but few people, they take advantage of this wonderful gift. It's a gift from Hashem that, that anyone could anyone could pick it up. It's like diamonds in the street, pick it up. So why don't people take advantage of this? Because people are under the impression that the creator is too vast. They say, ah, oh, the creator, what, what does he care about me, little old me? He just got to, too much to do. Uh, some things that they're too, that Hashem is, is too great or too busy to care about them. And other people think, they've been programmed to think that they can't have a direct and personal connection with Hashem because there are a lot of uh, highbrow clergymen out there with all different denominations that they make a living out of being in middlemen. Uh, tells me that they're the go-between. You got to be the go-between. And, uh, you know, you, who are you? You, don't, you can't have a direct list. You got to go through me and go through me. That, that's a pitchy bitchy that costs money. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, this is bad for business. If uh, somebody like Laser comes along and says, hey, what do you need? You can have a direct your own connection with the Shem. You don't have to pass a go. You don't have to collect $200. You go straight to a Shem. That's it. Okay. So both these misconceptions, that Hashem's too busy to hear from you, or that uh, Hashem doesn't take people directly. You have to go through an agent, an agency, or a middleman. No, the misconceptions. They're misconceptions, and let's say it nicely. But to say it uh, in street talk, they're lies. It's not true. It's not true. Now, give an example. Think how much we love our children. Stop and think how much we love our children. That can be how much we would do for our children and our grandchildren. Okay, our loving Father in heaven, he loves every one of us. Every one of us is his own son or his own daughter. It's only got one. And because uh, if we were created, that means that no one, uh, that the world can't exist without us. And the Shem has said, no, we have an individual thumbprint that shows that uh, no one else in the world has that. that testif that's testimony that Hashem created as individual, where Hashem's only, no matter how children, how many children he has, he only has one of us, each of us. And Hashem loves us unfathomable umpteen times more than the most loving parent loves his child. Okay, so that means that uh, Hashem is not too busy because the loving parent too busy to listen to the child? Absolutely no. And because this is just out of logic. But if you want to say, well, who said that? Rabbi Nachman says in Sichot Aran, Rabbi Nachman's discourses, he says that when one of Hashem's children speaks to him, Hashem drops everything he's doing and he listens. And he listens. That's how much he cares. That's how much he loves us. So there's no individual, either layman or clergyman, that has the right to interfere with a person's intimate, personal relationship with Hashem. Nobody's got the right. That is sanct. That is holy. Your relationship with Hashem, Hashem doesn't want anybody interfering. No way. Okay. So we know no sooner, no sooner need a middleman to reach our father in heaven than we need a, a middleman to reach our physical mother or father. No. Your, your mother or father say, oh, go, go to the secretary, make an appointment with me. You can't talk to me directly. No, it's ridiculous. Okay. And King David says that emphatically. He says, Hashem is close to all who call him in sincerity. That's in Psalm 145, verse 18. 
So every human has a birthright. We've got a wonderful inheritance. Every one of us is a rich, rich person. We have a birthright, and every one of us is entitled to cultivate his or own, her own personal relationship with the Shem. And it doesn't matter who we are or where we are, or where we were born, or what our background is, or what the color of our skin is, I did nothing, nothing. There's no difference. Each person is a human, human being. It's got that birthright, has the right to be close to Hashem. Okay, so the stronger we believe in Hashem, the stronger we have a Muna, the easier it is to cultivate a relationship with Him. And this is what comes first, the chicken and the egg. Also, the more we cultivate a personal relationship with Him, the easier it is to strengthen our pure and simple belief, which is uh, our moon, it becomes more tangible. Now, if we take, once again, a typical, take a Ben Yehuda dictionary, Hebrew English dictionary, something equivalent to the Oxford English dictionary, Hebrew English dictionary will translate the word emuna as faith or as belief. But like I always say, emuna is much, much more than that. Much more than that. Emunah is the type of level, it's the level of faith that enables a person to enjoy a personal and intimate relationship with the Shem. Now you can say, Lisa, it didn't matter if so we've been speaking for, for eight minutes and you already said that four times. I'm going to say it the fifth time. Your personal and intimate relationship with the Shem. Because in case you've been programmed in your childhood or by some clergyman or something that you can't have the personal and intimate relationship with the Shem, then we're going to pull this out, pull this out again and again and again. Hashem loves me. You got to tell yourself Hashem loves me and Hashem wants to hear me and Hashem wants me to be close to him, me personally with no middleman, no, no go between. But you say, oh, this sounds wonderful. It's easy. Okay. And uh, if anybody is completely new to our lessons, every time Hashem, Hashem literally means the name. Why do we say Hashem? To avoid saying God all the time. Because our third, the third commandment is not to take God's name in vain. And so we Hashem in Hebrew, it means the name. And uh, we only say the G-O-D in the context of prayer or blessing when, when we make a benediction. Okay, but even if it in teaching, when learning Torah, we say Hashem. Okay, so there is a catch the field. This sounds like a hunky dory. Okay, let's everybody, let's all run and develop a relationship with Hashem. Hold it. Have you ever seen the Super Bowl or the NBA Finals or the Mundial? You know what they have in common? There's two teams on the field. Nobody's going to pay so many. What do they pay? Uh, uh, I don't know if it's, if it's in England, maybe a ticket to Mundial. If they have uh, one of the semifinals in England, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be three, four hundred, five hundred quid, depending where you sit in the stadium. And uh, if it's in Argentina, you're going to pay a ton of money. But nobody's going to pay that kind of money for a ticket if there's only one team on the field. You want to see Argentina play the UK. That's a game. That's a game. Or play Ireland come up against Uruguay. That's a game. Or Germany come up against Mexico. That's a game. You got two teams on the field. Uh, when we want to get close to a Shem, this is the good inclination. That's the, the good team. Another team comes on the field. And that's the evil inclination. And evil clay shall let you do anything. I could sit. You, you want to learn Talmud? Uh, people say, want to learn Kabbalah? Do people you know, they learn Kabbalah? People think they can learn Kabbalah before they know all of Talmud, but that, that's a mistake. Okay. Evil connection has no problem with you learning Talmud, with you learning Kabbalah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And, be, and then don't that tell everybody that you're a, you're a Talmudic expert and that you're a, you're a Kabbalist and you know the secrets of creation and sense names. Oh, but you want to get to close to Shem, this no. Emuna, this no. Emuna, he calls up the reserves and fight you to be worse than the, the, than the battle in Donetsk. They'll fight you right and left. And so that's the, that why when we lift weights, why is that called resistance training? We lift weights called resistance training because we put resistance on our muscles. This big, this is our muscle. So why is there a difficulty in getting close to Hashem? There's difficulty in, in performing Hashem's commandments, difficulty in, in when we really learn Torah, the difficult because that's also resistance. By giving us resistance, we have to overcome the resistance of the evil inclination. This purifies our souls. This improves our character. And it gets even stronger to Hashem. I'll give you an example. How do you teach a baby how to walk? 
the baby, parent puts the baby down. If you have the baby in your arms all day long, the baby never learned to walk. Put the baby on the floor and the parent holds the arms and the baby yearns to get to the parent. So baby lunges toward the parent. Okay. And the parent puts him down again. This time, the parent takes a step back. Well, somebody from Amnesty International might say, what a cruel parent. Stay away from the baby. The baby might fall. Okay. So the baby goes and let's go to the parent just before he falls. The parent grabs him again. And then the next time, the parent takes two steps back. In other words, the parent makes it more difficult as a level of difficulty for the baby. That way, the baby learns to walk. And that baby way learns to walk proficiently. Not only that, look at you see it in all of nature. Uh, have you ever seen how a butterfly is born, how it comes out of the cocoon? It has to struggle, a struggle. Now, if someone took pity on the poor butterfly and they took a scalpel and made an incision in a premature incision in the cocoon, and the butterfly would come out, it would be lame and limp. The butterfly develops the strength of its wings by having to fight its way out of that shell, that cocoon. Okay, and this is the same thing. But we have to struggle. We have to struggle. If, if you can see, you can see they're learning Amuna. People, if, if remember, uh, our very first lesson, oh, Amuna hour, Amuna hour, it's coming on Zoom and it's live. And uh, we decided, uh, David and I decided, oh, we're going to publicize it on Facebook. Oh, Facebook. So we publicized it instead of doing our private emails and our private WhatsApp groups, published on Facebook. Why what we had the first lesson. We had the Nazis crash the lesson and they put flash, the, the, the worst spam, the worst porn, the worst the terrible things. I don't know if, if, if maybe I, I could see a few of you remember, remember that first lesson. It was unbelievable. That's the... And so we had to go and we had to outsmart the evil inclination next time. So what are we going to do? Okay, we can't put on public because there's, there's spammer groups on, on social media. So we made a private newsletter and a private email and to notice that one another privately. So that's why we don't advertise. Why? So we see this. But I remember David and I smiled. We enjoyed it because we we're waiting. Where's the surprise going to come from? Where are we going to get the opposition from? And by the way, it, it, it's one thing. But if, if there's no opposition in what we're doing, hey, we're doing something wrong. We're doing something wrong. You know, it, it, it's something. So uh, this, we see this right in the Torah. This is a template in Torah. Jacob had to fight Esau's angel. This is the archetype and the template for the war between good, which is Jacob, and evil, Esau's angel, okay? So once again, the, the evil inclination had no problem at all with religion. A lot of religious fanatics, and how many religious people you know that don't smile? Oh, hellfire and brimstone. Religion has nothing to do with Emuna. We're talking about Emuna. And there are many so-called religious, quote unquote, people that don't have smiles on their faces, that are not, particularly uh, moral and business and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you take an, an Amuna person, a person who believes in a Shem, he won't touch. It's an anathema to, for him to touch a scent that doesn't belong to him. Because that's gizl, that's, that's swindling, that's take something. And he, if he believes in a Shem, he knows that a Shem is going to give him or her whatever they need, exactly when they need it, and that their income it's already, it's already destined to reach them from, from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. But they don't have to, to do something dishonest to get income. But if a person says, okay, but what, what, what is a, a dishonesty in business? That's why the Gemara Tractate Shabbat says that the very first question they ask the soul when the soul leaves this world and goes up to the next world, did you negotiate with the Muna? People translate, did you negotiate fairly? But it says in the Gemara, did you negotiate with the Muna? With the, negotiate with the Muna means that the, a person is fair in business and in commerce. And he's not going to do anything that goes against the Torah. Because the Torah doesn't allow stealing. And the Torah doesn't allow swindling. And the Torah doesn't allow lying. And the Torah doesn't allow all types of things. But what do people do? When a person steals in business or is dishonest in commerce, the person is making a statement. Even the person is religious, quote unquote. He's saying, heaven forbid that Hashem can't give him the money he needs, he needs more. So he has to go beyond the boundaries of Torah, take more. So when he shortchanges his workers and doesn't pay his workers on time and all types of, all types of silly stings. And that, that's the evil inclination. The evil inclination will fight 
tooth and nail against the Muna, but yeah, you want to be religious? Go ahead, be religious. Just don't smile. Don't get close to Hashem. Don't have a Muna, and you can do whatever you want. So that's the battle of Jacob and Esau, and it continues on to this generation. So since the evil inclination is an angel, and we're people, we're humans, we can't overcome the evil inclination without soliciting Hashem's help. And so that's, how do we solicit Hashem's help? We ask for it. This is part of our personal relationship with Hashem. So a personal relationship with Hashem, what's the basis of a personal relationship with anyone? Communication. And what's the basic communication? Speech communication. We speak to one another. And I'd say so many people, they have communication problems, young people today, because they don't communicate. Their thumbs work. And they don't smile. They have colon parentheses. They have all types of emoticons. And they, they communicate with the emoticons. So you see people, and, and, and they just don't smile. A young person, just this, this week I went to a store and there was a salesman and didn't smile at all, nothing, no emotion on the guy's face. And I said, uh, I, I thanked him for his help. It was very, he was courteous. He was courteous, but like no emotion, very straight, like, like a, a zombie. But when I, I thanked him for his help, uh, maybe he wasn't used to getting a compliment. He says, no problem, happy to do it. But he said, well, you know, I say, no problem, happy to do it. And he said that without emotion. And then went back to his text messaging. <laughs> you see people, they, they lack communication skills. Because of text messaging. How many times you see young people? And even now, Shalom Bayit problems in marriage. Young people married. And after, after the wedding, they don't know how to talk to one another. They're sitting at dinner. And especially the first year of marriage, they should be talking, talking and talking together. And they're sitting at dinner. And the one, this guy's answering his emails. And she's, she's on her social media. It's not a marriage. It's not a relationship. A married relationship is communication, first of all, communication. So that's what these lessons are all about, our mode of communication with the Shem. And that's our Muna, that's our personal relationship with the Shem. So we're not in all our lessons in with the language of Amuna lessons, our language, they're not about religion and they're not about uh, proper prescribed prayer and they're not about liturgy. Look, they're talking about most of the time, our own personal prayers. We're mentioning a few, a few prescribed prayers that are very good for Amuna. We're going to talk about one tonight. But really, the most pure form of prayer is prayer that comes out of our heart, our speech to Hashem, our own personal speech to Hashem. These are prayers that have never been printed in a prayer book. These are prayers, sometimes you go to the synagogue and, hey, you pray and you feel right, it's the same thing, and your mind is in... Uh, your body's in the synagogue, but your mind is in Monte Carlo or in Bermuda or Mammy Beach or wherever it is, or in business on Wall Street, but it's oftentimes not in the prayer. When you speak to Hashem in your own words, and we'll be learning about the type of speech, the gratitude and, and praise of Hashem, and, and the different types of Amuna language, language of Amuna, uh, these, this is the purest form of prayer because it's coming right out of our heart. And we talk to Hashem, we're not thinking about something else. We're thinking about Hashem. Okay. So, uh, today's lesson is called Outstretched Arms. But in particular, this is our third lesson in language of Amuna, and it's Outstretched Arms. Okay. Where to get the name of the lesson from? We open up the book of Exodus, chapter 17. And we see the war of Amalek. The Israelites, they fought a bitter battle against their arch enemy, Amalek. And Moses, when he raised his hands in prayer, he raised his hands, elevated his hands, said, then the Israelites prevailed in the battle. And when Moses' arms, Moses was already an elderly man then, his arms became tired and he dropped his arms, then the Amalekites, they prevailed. So Aaron and Hur, uh, Aaron was Moses' brother, Hur was the son of Miriam, Moses' Moses' nephew, Miriam, Moses' sister. So Moses' brother and his nephew, what they did, they sat Moses down on a big rock. Moses wouldn't sit on something more comfortable. He said he wouldn't sit on something comfortable when the Israelites were in battle. And Aaron stood on one side, Hur stood on another side, and they held Moses' arms up. And as they held Moses' arms up, then the Israelites were able to prevail. Okay, but here's what the Torah says. The Torah describes this in chapter 17 of Exodus, verse 12. And the Torah says, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, they, that's Aaron and Hur, they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat thereon. 
and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, the one on one side, on the other on the other side, and his hands were emunah. What's the Torah saying? Moses' hands became emunah. His hands were emunah. So we can ask ourselves, well, what's the Torah talking about? Okay. Rashi answers. Rashi answers. Rashi come and may extrapolates on that comments. And Rashi says that when Moses' arms were outstretched to the heavens in earnest, faith-filled prayer, he was praying for the for the victory of the people, that uh that was what means that arms in emunah, that his arms were extended in prayer. So we learn from that that emuna and prayer are synonymous from that Rashi commentary. Okay, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov adds something else. If we open up Likutei Moran to the first section, Torah 91, Rabbi Nachman says that raising one's hands in fervent prayer, it causes emuna to permeate the hands. When you wash your hands, and before you say the blessing for wash your hands, you raise your hands and, and you say, I raise my hands in holiness. Okay, this brings emuna into the hands. In other words, so we, we learn from that, and Rabbi Nachman takes us from the Zohar. Uh, we learn from that that it's our job to drive emuna, not just in the brain, but every part of our body, every part of our body. That's what we're talking about tonight how to permeate Amuna in every part of the body. So the Amuna is capable of infusing every part of our body. And we'll see what that does for us when Amuna penetrates every part of our body. So we don't even have to deduce that teaching from Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman, even before Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman was the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov had one of his prime disciples whose name was Rabbi Nachman Mendel of Vitebsk. We call him Yiddish, Reb Mendel Vitebsker. Okay, Reb Mendel Vitebsker wrote a classic book. It's a combination uh, Kabbalistic Hasidic book. It's called Priya Aretz, The Fruit of the Holy Land. And Rabbi Nach Menachem Mendel, he writes that, this is a quote, it translates, it translates quote, Emunah must be so strong in the heart that is generated to every limb in the body. In other words, what the Vitebsker Rebbe is teaching us that when emuna is so strong in the heart, imagine like a flame in the heart. When it's a flame in the heart, imagine he's a, another metaphor, then it warms up the entire body. Okay, if it's like a little match, a little pilot like that's not enough. But when emuna is a flame, the whole body feels the warmth. And so if that flame is a fire of emuna, then the whole body has the warmth of emuna. Or if that flame is the light of Amuna, then the whole body gets the illumination of Amuna. And we will see that in Kabbalah, Rabbi Chaim Vital in Shari Kedusha, he writes just that. So we see this theme recurs all over in the holy books, in the Hasidic books and, and Kabbalistic books, that we are capable of imbibing the whole body with Amuna, not just in, in our brain. Okay. King David goes a step further king david in psalm 119 verse 86 he says Kol mitzvah all your commandments are emunah he's saying to Shem, all your commandments are emunah so what's it king david telling us that every commandment is based on emunah but even more so take a closer look at what king david is telling us that every word of king david every word of psalms is so deep he says all your mitzvahs are emunah there are 613 mitzvot in the Torah, and they correspond to the 613 parts of the body, the 613 parts of the body. Now, you've often heard me mention Sefer Haredim. It's a classic book written by one of the Arizal's prime disciples, Rebbe Lazar Askari. Okay. And he writes about the, the relationship of each mitzvah to its corresponding part of the body. Oftentimes, we can discover a bodily ailment or cure a bodily ailment because the body suffers when the corresponding mitzvah to that part of the body is either neglected or, or not performed properly or transgressed against. Okay. But uh, according to these thoughts, if a person performs all the 613 mitzvot, and does each one of these 613 mitzvot with sincerity, then he or she will succeed in 
driving a muna down to every part of their body. But that's not so simple. There are some mitzvot that women only do, and there are some mitzvot that men only do, and there are some mitzvot that can only be done in the holy temple, the, the, the ritual sacrifices, and nobody can possibly perform all 613 mitzvot by themselves. Okay, so how, how do we do? According to what we learned, how, how do a person wants to have a muna in every part of his body, wants the illumination of divine light in every part of his body. Uh, I'm going to teach you a quicker and easier way to infuse your entire body with the muna. Not to go with the project and to learn the, all of Sefer Chinuch, which lists that every one of the 613 mitzvot, and then go and try to, 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 to try to observe every one of them. Okay. But let's ask a question. Let's preface the question. What do we need a body full of a muna for? Okay, per se, enough, he's got a moon in the brain, or enough, he's got a moon in the heart. What do we need a body full of a moon for? Okay, most people are aware that Hashem created the world. If you talk, get them on the side, and they're not public, you know, and, and political correctness, where the G word in modern society is not so popular. Okay, get them off. Everybody knows. What, so who do you think invented the world? Uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter? No, they didn't invent the world. Okay. Those people, they know. They know Hashem what created the world. But yet, look at them. They're not happy. How many people suffer from depression, clinical depression? Uh, tens of millions of Americans. I think the number is 40 million. Uh, how many people have anxiety? Uh, people that have maybe an anxiety or clinical depression. Uh, some people might have light anxiety. Light unhappiness, light worry, but even light the hurt. When a person has a body full of amuna, there's no such thing as worry. There's no such thing as negative emotions. There's no such thing as jealousy. Jealousy and amuna, they don't go together. Because a person has amuna, believes that Hashem gives him or her whatever they need. They're not jealous. They don't look at anybody else. They're not jealous of anybody else. They know that what the song songs say, different strokes for different folks. That this person... He's got a, a car because he's an insurance salesman. He needs to drive to place to place. I don't need to drive to place to place. I don't need a car. Or this person has a, a toolbox with a monkey wrench in it because he's a plumber. I don't necessarily need a monkey wrench because I'm not a plumber. And you see, but by same token, everyone has their own toolbox. Okay, we talk about this in uh, Path to Your Peak. Everyone has their own toolbox. So there's no need to be jealous. Jealousy is a ridiculous emotion. And, and with the moon, it's really, it's, it's so, such a waste of emotional and spiritual energy. Okay. So how come people aren't happy? They're not happy because their amuna stays left in the brain. Oh yeah, they know the Shem created the world and they know they're supposed to keep Shabbat. So they do keep Shabbat. And they know they're supposed to eat kosher. So they do eat kosher, but it's in the brain. Sometimes a person eats kosher, but then goes to the supermarket and he sees that, Kosher chickens cost twice as much as the non-kosher chickens. He's unhappy about it. He's got a muna. He's delighted that he's to get, able, able to get his hands on kosher chickens. People, some live in a place in the world where they can't find a kosher chicken or, or a kosher piece of meat. They can't enjoy that. Okay, so the, with, with the muna, a person feels good about everything. But how could a person can have a muna in the brain and yet be upset about the high price of kosher food or be upset about the high price of a Torah education, or be upset about uh, how much his synagogue membership got. Why, why be upset? This is a, if, it, if, if there are tools that help me serve Hashem, why be upset? So we see that the longest difference, the longest distance in the world is not between Jerusalem and Maui. The longest distance in the world is between the brain and the heart. What the brain knows bringing the amuna in the brain, and everybody academically knows, they know, no Hashem runs the world, and a person can memorize the 13 principles of amuna and believe in them, but to live by them, to bring them down to the heart, that is a long distance, to bring that amuna that we know in the brain down to the heart. So if we take another look at the teachings of Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Atebsk, uh, I heard from my own esteemed rabbi and spiritual guide, the Melitzer Rebbe, uh, Melissa Rebbe says that the moon is not complete from the brain to the heart. 
Amun is not complete, says the Rebbe, until you bring it from the very top, your brain, until the bottom of the soles of your feet, until the whole body is permeated with Amunah. Okay, so this, read this in Rebbe Nachman, and Rebbe Nachman Mendel of the Tepsk, and in the, they tell me the disciples of Baal Shem Tov, and I heard even more what the Rebbe told me today, at the first time I heard that specifically, get it down to the bottom of your feet. Until you've got a muna in the bottoms of your soles of your feet, it's not there yet, you're not finished. So we do have an obligation to drive a muna to every part of our body. And why the soles of our feet? You know what happens when you have feet with a muna? Feet with a muna, they're light. They'll run to the synagogue. They'll run to the kosher busher to buy a kosher thing. They'll run to do, to help a little old lady cross the street. Uh, they run to do a good deed. Okay, they, they feel like it, you're, you're on wind, that you've got, uh, you've got motors in your sneakers. Okay, and that's why, that's why uh, we need feet with a muna. Eyes with a muna. What are eyes with a muna is? We have to, you heard a lot of times say eyes of a muna. Eyes of a muna see the world in an op optimistic way. Just yesterday, somebody asked me about, uh, and somebody would, what do you think about the terrible political situation? I said, there's no situation, it's terrible. I said, it's a situation from Hashem. Hashem knows what he's doing. Okay, I'm very happy with the way Hashem runs the world. Okay, but not only understand everything, but we have a Muna. We don't have a problem with anything. It's all from Hashem. He alone did, does, and will do everything. So eyes with a Muna see a beautiful world. Eyes of Muna see good people. Uh, a mouth of a Muna doesn't talk slander about another person. A mouth of a Muna won't say a lie. A mouth of Muna, believe in Hashem, this, and, and, and all the way down, all the way down. Now, what about ears of a Muna? Ears of a Muna, you know what ears of a Muna can do? It's amazing. Can you imagine hearing a turtle dove in the morning? Turtle dove in the morning has a song. The one turtle doves in his air to show have a song. Give a Give a And you listen to somebody saying, what's the turtle dove in air to show saying? You have a saying the first word of the, the, the priestly blessing. You should be blessed. You should be blessed. Listen closely. If a person listens closely, they can hear the words, the animals, the birds. And King David could do this in every single creation. King David could understand the language of every bird, every uh, mineral, plant, animal, a plant. He could hear plants talking. And that's why King David was able to assemble the song of creation perik shira and in that king david describes how every single creation prays hashem's name so say we hear a frog croak ribbit ribbit frog's not saying ribbit ribbit the frog is saying bullshank fall mal he's saying blessed is your blessed is your holy name a cricket praising hashem's name this is king david this is what ears of amuna ears of amuna you hear beautiful things in the world now the same two people can hear uh, a Boston Philharmonic Orchestra and one person get no enjoyment and the other person is in, enraptured because the, the second person has more appreciation, understanding of music. A person has an appreciation, understanding of cre creation. How do you have an appreciation, understanding creation when you get closer to the creator and you can hear creation? And that, that's proof of King David. King David knew how every creation praises Hashem. So, so that's the ears of Amunah. And a heart of a Muna. Oh, that's great. Heart of a Muna. Heart of a Muna. No worry. No anxiety. No jealousy about anybody. No heart of a Muna. Just feels nice. Feels nice. Hashem. And when you have a heart of a Muna, that saves a lot of cardiac problems. Because how many negative emotions create havoc to the cardiovascular system? It's not good. The body was not meant to suffer. The body was meant to live a happy life of Amuna. But since we don't strive toward Amuna, you see, modern society, they're full of meds and full of negativity and full of negative emotions. So maybe it's time. Last night I spoke to a person, counsel person, and the person was telling about his problems and this, that. I said, Amuna, maybe to learn this and strengthen when I hear, no, Rabbi, I think I do this, do this. So I finally said to the guy, after listening to it for an hour, I say, you know something? If a person is not happy, then that means he's, he or she is a loser in life. 
Now, if you're a losing professional sports team uh, and you're losing too much, well, people aren't going to pay to see. You're not going to make any money. So you better either change your players or change your game plan. Okay, since you're the player, you're not going to change your players, but you got to change the game plan. So why people, they don't want to try a Muna? Because they're afraid of relationship with the Shem. Afraid of relationship with Shem, a relationship with the Shem, it's also obligating. Because a person can't have a relationship with the Shem on one side and then turn around and, uh, and go against the Shem on the other side. Okay, so I promise before, I'm not going to break my promise, to show you a quick way to permeate a Muna in the whole body. Okay, so language of Muna, they were capable of saturating the body with the Muna. I once said that in lesson, and there was a, a heckler in the back, and uh, he said, hey, Rabbi, you mean I can uh, fill myself up in prayer like I pull up in the gas station, uh, and I say to the gas jockey, uh, fill her up, I want 95 octane Amuna. <laughs> the guy thought he was doing, oh, he'd probably say, enjoy everybody. He said, it's, it's that easy? And I told him, uh, it's easier than that. The guy was floored. easier than that? What do you mean easier than that? Okay, as you do, you go in the gas station and you have to wait your turn and you have to wait till the gas jockey serves you. And then when he serves you, you have to wait. Sometimes uh, he spills gas on your car and gets your car dirty and this and that. Then you have to go uh, and pay. And nowadays they don't deal in cash. You have to go inside and you've got the, the cashier buying a glass thing. You have to wait to pass. By the time you fill up your car and pay for it and get back, it's all rigor roll. So easy, much easier to fill up my body with the moon. All I got to do was go someplace where I could be alone and preferably someplace that's scenic and nice out in nature and where nobody will bother me and speak to Hashem. And once again, the more scenic, the better. If you could uh, go out to a park or if you're fortunate enough to live near a lake or the ocean, be okay. And here's what you do. Think about your gifts in life. Uh, start with things that you might take for granted. How many people thanked Hashem for the air they breathe? Anybody thank Hashem for the air they breathe today? Okay, now if not, then thank him right now. Okay, we thank Hashem for the air they breathe. I'm sure uh, David Dome is thanking, he's profusely thanking Hashem for every breath because every breath is coming with a lot of pain. Okay, so why wait? Why wait to get the flu or asthma or COVID or any other problem before we thank Hashem? While we have the health, thank you Hashem for this healthy day. Take a deep breath. Thank you, Hashem, for the air I breathe. Thank you, Hashem, for my lungs. And then take a second deep breath. And a second deep breath, now do like a, a Pilates breathing exercise. Pilates breathing exercise is when we inhale with 10 impulses. We do a 10 impulse inhale, and we inhale through the nose, and then we exhale, a 10 pulse exhale through the mouth, and do it again. 10 pulses in, 10 pulses out. Yoga, they have a breathing exercise too. Yoga goes seven pulse inhale and 11 pulse outhale. Maybe the yoga is a gamma, 7 11. But okay. Pilates is 10 10. Okay. Whatever it is, whatever it is it, try that and do it slow and deliberating. And that's the second time. Now, the third time, breathe naturally and you think, oh, your lungs feel better, your nostrils feel better. The air seems cleaner. You know why? The air hasn't changed. It was the same air you bro you were breathing a minute and a half ago before you started. But meanwhile, what you've done by thanking Hashem for the air and thanking Hashem that you've done your personal prayer of gratitude, you have driven emuna into your lungs. You have permeated your nostrils with emuna. You feel better and taste better because you now have emuna, which penetrated your lungs and your nostrils. That's fantastic. Okay, let's do another exercise in life. Okay, contemplate your healthy heart. Think of the people, poor people that have heart attacks, poor people that have uh, pacemakers and have trouble with pacemakers, poor people that have cardiac issues, poor people, okay, and you're not connected to a pacemaker, you're not connected to a, a machine, you're not connected to this, your heart works fantastic. And ponder every beat. Now just imagine, imagine, okay, uh, 
that Hashem is personally massaging your heart, every beat. That's Hashem personally massaging your heart. And so you imagine it's the real thing. That is Hashem personally massaging your heart. When you think about that, wow. It is the Almighty. I mean, that's the Rambam tells us. He alone did, does, and will do. The heart is not on automatic pilot. That is the Almighty. People can understand. Read Divine Direction how the Almighty is perfectly take care of the macro part of creation, which is our hearts, as well as the micro, micro part of creation, the macro part of creation, the, the great galaxies. Hashem is deciding the path that the great galaxies fly thousands of miles an hour through space. And Hashem is deciding our diastolic and systolic blood pressure and how many pulse, uh, that our pulse rate and everything. It's a mind bog. That's personally Hashem. That's nobody else. Nobody else is doing that. And you know what happens when you thank Hashem for your heartbeat? You thank Hashem for your heart? It guarantees you another day of a healthy heart. Because Hashem says, if you thank me today, I'm going to give you another reason to thank me tomorrow. Okay? That's the word. And that's what our sages tell us in the Gemara, schar mitzvah mitzvah. That the reward of doing a mitzvah is another mitzvah. So the reward of... An expression of gratitude is another expression of gratitude. And that meanwhile, person's got high blood pressure, do that exercise for a few minutes and then take your blood pressure and see you haven't changed your eating, the high blood pressure, you should eat, stay off the salt and certainly stay off the white sugar. But you check your blood pressure, guarantee it's gone down, gone down. If a few minutes of thanking Hashem for your heart, it's going to be great for your whole cardiovascular system. And it's the best cardiac insurance you could get. Okay. So now let's uh, interject with something King Solomon taught us. King Solomon taught us that know Hashem in all your ways, Paul de Hodeu, and he will straighten your path. What does King Solomon mean? Rabbi Chaim Vital, who was the prime disciple of the Arizal, and he wrote down all the teachings of the Arizal. The Arizal didn't write them himself. Reb Chaim Vital wrote them, the 15 volumes of Kabbalah, the Arizal's teachings. He says that if one contemplates Hashem in whatever they're doing, then they invoke an illumination of divine light in that part of the body that they're mobilizing in the particular action they're doing. Okay, so if a person's feeling his heartbeat and he's thanking Hashem, he is sending divine light to the heart. What's that divine light? It's light of Muna. If a person is walking and a person is pondering a Shem, thinking about a Shem while he's walking, that's why I often suggest, great for body and soul, that a person engage in personal prayer while taking a walk. Okay. And uh, you can see it, it, it makes it at it, it, your legs. Try another exercise. This is a great exercise. Stop and think about your heart. Stop thinking about all the parts of your body that work. Forget about that. What, what, we have difficulties. Let's put the difficulties aside. They're not going to go away, but well, we'll handle them. For the moment, thank Hashem for the blessings in your life. You got clothes on your back? But if you're not unclothed out in the street, okay, thank Hashem for the clothes. You have a place to live? Thank Hashem for your bed. Thank Hashem for the roof over the head. Thank Hashem for the meal you ate today. Thank Hashem for everything. And Stop and think about all the millions of gifts, all the millions of gifts. Now, look up in the sky and think about Hashem and think about all the good he does for you. And if a human being would do one-tenth of that, one one-hundredth, one iota of that, you'd be really grateful to him. So now say to Hashem, Hashem, I love you. Hashem, I really love you. Say it a third time, Hashem, I love you. Now, once you do something else, before you say it the fourth time, put your hands in your pocket. And I look up in the sky and say, Hashem, I love you. You're going to feel like somebody tied you in a straitjacket. What do you mean put my hands in the pocket? Hashem, I love you. Hashem without stretched arms. You can't do it. Okay. So now the fifth time, take your hands out of the pocket and let it go. So how come your hands want to fly up? The outstretched arms want to fly up? Because by saying you love Hashem, you're talking to Hashem, that's a beautiful personal prayer, it's a sonnet, it's, it's, it's a, on, on the level of King David's Psalms, it's from your heart, deep in your heart, 
you're driving Amuna into your arms. But if your arms, you, you, you drive the, your, your heart, if your arms are close to the heart, and the heart is heating up the one heart where the love comes from, and the arms feel the heat from the heart, and the arms are what a praise to Hashem. Well, how can we see a person in earnest prayer who's always got uplifted arms? Where do the uplifted arms come from? Comes from real Amuna, driving Amuna into the heart. Okay, so now let's go. Okay, we, we've driven Amuna into, into our hearts, we've driven Amuna into our lungs, into uh, our eyes and our mouth, and we go out for a walk and we thank Hashem for our legs and we thank Hashem really profusely. If you don't have pain in your knees or your ankles, how many millions of people suffer pains in these? You don't pain in your knees? Hashem, wow, I've got no pains in my knees. This is great. And even have a little pain in the knee, try something like this. Hashem, you know, I, I could say, despite the little pain I got in my knee, I can still walk. Ooh, Hashem says that you thank me for that pain in your knee. Tomorrow, my beloved son or daughter, you're not going to have it because I'm going to give you a real reason to thank you. <laughs> this is the power of gratitude, power of the prayers of gratitude. So wear comfortable walking shoes and thank Hashem for them too. Don't leave anything. And then you know what that, that's going to do? According to the principle, that Rabbi Chaim Vital teaches us in Shari Kedusha, and according to the command they got from the Melitzer Rebbe, drive a Muna down to the feet. That's exactly what we're doing. We're thanking Hashem for our feet and for our legs, and while we're walking, we are driving a Muna down to our feet. So you can see, as you get warmed up physically, and as you get warmed up spiritually, you feel lighter. You feel lighter. If you've got a, if you're monitoring your pace. If you've got a workout watch or something like that, you'll see that you're walking faster. You're walking quickly, and it seems easier. It seems easier when you walk slower, it would seem heavier. In the beginning, now it seems easier. As if Hashem gave you wings. Hashem puts you in the wings of eagle. Okay, so without even feeling it, those exercises we talked about, thanking Hashem, taking a walk, but taking the deep breath, they enhance our physical health also because the body and the soul are connected. That's what you can see. Psychosomatic uh, disease, a person suffers from a psychosomatic illness, really feels the illness, okay? But because it's triggered by a, by a, a bad mood, a bad a negative emotions. So this is the power of the language of Amuna. And this is the power of driving Amuna to our whole body it makes our souls feel better. It makes us more emotionally healthy. It makes us more physically healthy. And there's no greater declaration of Amuna than speaking to Hashem in our own words. So what's King David say in Psalm 116, verse 10? I believe because I spoke. This is his book of 150 Psalms. That's testimony. That's the, the protocol of King David's own personal prayers with Hashem. And how come we all can relate to that? So King David was Mashiach. King David was the anointed king of Israel. As anointed king, uh, we learn that his neshama, his soul, was a kaleidoscope of all the souls, a kaleidoscope of all the souls. And so every soul can relate with what King David is talking because King David, when you read Psalms and and you cry and tears come down your eyes. Is this talking about me? This is my problem. This is something that I, I didn't know how to express in my own words. And a, a fear or a trepidation. And it's okay to express fear to Hashem. But once you take talk to Hashem and express fear, don't be afraid anymore. Because Hashem is right there with you. Hashem is right there with you. That's what King David says. Though I walk in the valley of death, I shall not fear because you are with me. As soon as we live a life of Amunah, and we have the language of Amunah, and we talk to Hashem like King David talked to Hashem. There's no fear of death. There's no fear of anything. And a person is calm. A person is happy. A person is collected. And it's so much when you see a person that the person is suffering from negative emotions and seesaw emotions. So people don't like to hear it, but it's a lack of Amunah. And that's why we have so many wonderful uh, psychotherapists in our group. Dr. Kim Kreinick in New York, she's a PhD psychologist. She took all that, to put it aside, and she treats people according to principle of Amuna. It's, it's the, the real deal because it works. All of a sudden it's effective. 
and the psychological theories that they change, they change every every, every so often. That once Junger you know, is in is in um, the Freud, once Freud is in the mode, and, and and Jung is popular, then there's Skinner, then there's Gestalt, then there's here and there. Torah never goes out of style, and Muna never goes out of style. It's been in style ever since our forefather Abraham and and our and ancestral mother Sarah. That ever since them, okay, so. Instead of all these exercises, give you one prayer that also will permeate and muna into your whole body. Make it easy. One stop shopping. Tonight's lesson is one stop shopping. If you've ever heard of the Nishmas prayer, I'm going to go through the Nishmas prayer. Uh, I took the Nishmas prayer, and the only translations that, that I saw, I wasn't enamored with them. I had to translate it myself. Okay. So the nishmas, nishmas kol chai, it means every living soul. This prayer is so powerful that there's all types, it invokes all kinds of good things. And we have a uh, uh, tradition from Rebid al-Hasid, a tremendous 12th century sage uh, from the Rabbi the Shach, the Rabbi the Shach, a 16th century sage, that when this prayer is said 40 days in a row, and it said in earnest, person can accomplish whatever he wants. If it's a soulmate or, or a new job or, or whatever, it's really powerful. And I've used this ploy with a lot of people, uh, nishmas, saying nishmas every day until they see salvations. And then once they get their salvation, to say and make a Thanksgiving meal and say nishmas again with 10 people in front of Hashem. It's a great word, fantastic, fantastic. This prayer I've seen with my own eyes that has brought children into the world with people that had, didn't have children. Okay, so let me read this, the prayer to you. Okay, and, and once again, this is uh, Laser's translation. And listen to this, this prayer. It's just, we say this on Shabbat in the morning, and we say this on every festival in the morning, and Sukkot in the morning, and on Shavuot in the morning, and on Pesach, every day of Pesach in the morning. It's called Nishmat Kol Chai. We say in the Yiddish accent, Nishmas, and it is so, it's a really powerful prayer. It's and be for people that are calm and collected, they daven, they in a staid manner. And Nishmas, a lot of people just, just go crazy. They look like holy rollers when they're saying Nishmas. And uh, I know the, the roof comes off in, in, in our synagogue, the Melitzer Shul, the roof comes off on, on Shabbat in the morning and say Nishmas. And uh, just, just don't even try to control ourselves. Okay, listen to what it says. Okay, this prayer is capable of bringing amuna to every part of your body. If you say it, the people you don't fly through it, but say it word for word understanding. Okay, every living soul shall bless your name, Hashem our God, and the spirit of all flesh shall glorify and exalt your remembrance, our King, always. From this world to the next world, you are God. And aside from you, we have no king who delivers, saves, redeems, rescues, sustains, and answers, and has mercy in every time of trouble and distress. We have no other king but you. You are the God of the first and the last, God of all creatures, master of all generations, who extolled with countless praise, who directs the world with loving kindness and his creations with compassion. And Hashem neither sleeps nor slumbers. He awakens the sleepers and he rouses the drowsy and he gives speech to the voiceless and he releases the imprisoned and he supports the faltering and he strengthens, he straightens those who are bent over. To you alone, Hashem, we give thanks. If our mouths were filled with song like the sea and our tongues were exultation like the multitude of its waves and our lips were praised like the breath of the horizon and our eyes shined like the sun and the moon and our hands were outspread like the wings of eagles in the sky and our legs were swift as deer, we could not sufficiently praise you, Hashem, our God and God of our ancestors and bless your name for even one of the thousands of thousands and thousands of billions of favors, wonders and miracles that you did for us and for our ancestors before us. You delivered us from Egypt, Hashem, our God. You redeemed us from the house of bondage. You fed us in famine and provided us for insatiation. You saved us from the sword and spared us from plague. You guarded us from terrible and lingering illnesses. Until now, your mercy has come to our aid and your compassion has never left us. 
never abandon us, Hashem, our God, ever. Therefore, our limbs that you have placed within us and the spirit and soul that you have breathed in our nostrils and the tongue that you have placed in our mouth, they shall bless, glorify, sanctify, adore, and crown your holy name. For every mouth will thank you and every tongue will avow by you. Every eye will gaze its cast to you and every knee will bend to you. All who stand and bow down to you. Every heart shall revere you and every internal organ and kidneys will sing your name. As it is written, all my bones will say, Hashem, who is like you? You save the poor from those who are stronger and the poor and the destitute from those that would swindle them. Who resembles you? Who can equal you and who is comparable to you? The great, mighty, and awesome God, God on high, master of heaven and earth. We shall praise, extol, glorify, and bless your holy name. As King David says, bless Hashem my soul and all my innards his holy name. Okay, that's the prayer. And I mentioned many people that normally they pray quietly. Uh, they go beyond enthusiasm when they say this prayer. And they shout, and they dance, and they gesticulate. And there are many stories of the righteous and pious people that felt like their souls were leaving their bodies every time they said this prayer. Or Rebbe Uri of Strelisk, before Shabbat, he would write a will and testament and leave it with the family just in case his soul would leave him when he would say Nishmas on, on, on Shabbat in the morning. This is, this, would, this is the power of this prayer. And I said, people are near fainted, near fainted saying this. So here's how Nishma's prayer imbues Emunah in different parts of the body. We said mouth a couple of times. As if our mouths were filled with song like the sea, and every mouth will thank you. By saying this, this brings Emunah into the mouth. The tongue, it's a, the prayer says, our tongues were exaltation like the multitude of the waves, and every tongue will avow by you. And also, there's a, in other places also, our lips. Our lips are praised like the breath of the horizon. Our eyes, our eyes shine like the sun and the moon. And every eye will gaze as cast you. Bring a moon into our eyes. Letting us see the world beautifully is good for our eyesight too, especially our spiritual eyesight. Hands, our hands are outspread like eagles of the sky. Legs, our legs, they're swift as deer. And even our entire body and soul. We say the limbs that you have placed within us and the spirit you have breathed in our nostrils and the tongue that you placed in our mouth, they bless, praise, glorify, adore, and sanctify, and crown your name. A heart, every heart shall revere you, Hashem, and our internal organs, the, the, the bladder, the, the, the bladder, the, the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, every internal organ and kidneys will sing your name. Knees, you want to have healthy knees? Every knee will bend to you. Nishmat gives that, and Nishmat holds your whole skeleton. We say, all my bones will say, Hashem was like you. Wow, <laughs> this Nishma is a wonderful prayer with amazing powers. Just think about it. I, I, my heart quickens. I, I lose my breath. <laughs> and I said, people have said it 40 days in a row, and they've seen tremendous miracles. And that's the power. Not only that, the miracle of having something miraculous like a moon has spread your whole body. A moon is above nature. That means your body above nature. Maybe a doctor will say your body is limited to this or your your uh, longevity is limited to this, not with Amuna. Amuna goes way past. Amuna defies nature. So the Nishmas prayer, the reason I gave it so much attention, it's a wonderful template that it teaches us the language of Amuna. If it take, like, I take a, a text, you learn a foreign language and you learn a classic book in that language. Okay, so to teach the language of Amuna, you take the, the Nishmas prayer and we teach that because that is capable of infusing our entire being with emuna, And Bazaat Hashem, Hashem should help us internalize tonight's lesson that we should be full of emuna and full of happiness and inner peace. Amen.